Thanks, Barb. And I'd like to um, acknowledge Dr. Angela Lin's work in this area because she, she and Barb are really the ones that uh, brought my, me into this uh, area of research. And it, it evolved after the last meeting when we all got together and decided, based on inputs from you all, that this is an area that is very important to the community and that we should make resources available to you. Um, so th some of the, much of what I'm going to talk about is related to the work that happened since last year. So um, after the 2018 meeting, those of us who decided that autopsy and Turner syndrome is vital for research got together in a working group. And many of you might have seen the special issue in the American Journal of Medical Genetics, Part C, that came out in January, February this year. That resulted from our meetings and discussion. We did a review of what was known about autopsy as, and how it related to Turner syndrome and how we could promote autopsy as a, as a valuable tool to understand Turner syndrome better. Um, so this is the article that resulted from that. It's in that special issue if you have it. Uh, it's called Donating Our Bodies to Science, a Discussion About Autopsy and Organ Donation in Turner Syndrome. So I always start with the definition of autopsy because it can be very confusing to people to understand what it means, what the options are, and so forth. So an autopsy is simply a set of techniques used in forensic medicine to attempt to determine the cause of death in unexplained cases. So it is a very wide definition. You, it literally can mean taking pictures only. It can mean extracting organs and doing detailed studies or just doing some studies in a lab. All of those can be autopsies. They're all very different. Um, generally, it involves the collection of some blood and some tissues. But as you'll see, there's very little in the way of standardization. In fact, autopsy can mean very different things depending on who does it and where you go. So what, is, what do we think of as the utility of autopsy? In most cases, we use autopsy to understand why someone died suddenly and unexpectedly. That means someone without a known cause of death, like cancer or another kind of terminal condition, who passes away suddenly, someone who's very young, in whom we wouldn't expect sudden death, and then any uh, deaths in people with genetic disorders or structural defects that might predispose them to death. Um, and I would argue that all of these apply to Turner syndrome. So Turner syndrome is at the forefront of our need for autopsy because it's at the intersection of all these high-risk types of areas. And we know that because we know that there's a threefold increased risk of un unexplained, largely unexplained premature death in Turner syndrome. Uh, this indicates, this is data from Europe showing the deaths, causes of death uh, for, uh, for all ages, and uh, the thing that I always draw people's attention to is the purple bars, which are cardiovascular disease. And you can see that as you get older, from, from 15 to 44 years, and then from above 45 years, cardiovascular disease becomes the leading cause of death in Turner syndrome. And in many cases, there are other specific causes that we know about related to things that are understood about Turner syndrome, but I would argue that most of these cases we still don't understand what actually caused death. And so that's why autopsy is very important for us to be able to prevent or come up with ways to prevent deaths and extend the lifespan of Turner syndrome patients. So these are the kinds of questions that we came up with in the article to um, get people to understand why autopsy is so important. We don't still understand the causes of death in Turner syndrome in most cases, particularly in those people who die suddenly. Um, and we also don't know how many women who have not had uh, investigations during life have unsuspected anatomic disease. So this would be things like heart defects that never got found during life, other kinds of chronic illnesses that were not diagnosed. 
And a lot of that would be very useful for us because we, we need to know what are the prevalence of all these things. Should we make new recommendations about who needs to get screened and so forth? And we won't be able to have evidence for the, to do this without good studies. Other things from a research perspective, we still don't understand why some cells and tissues specifically function abnorm abnormally in Turner syndrome. And we don't understand how that relates to chromosomal changes. We know that a lot of women with Turner syndrome are mosaics, but we don't understand how that causes disease in some parts of the body and not others. And we also still don't understand why growth is fundamentally abnormal in Turner syndrome. So studying the cells and tissues is an invaluable resource because, as you might know, there are no animal models that, like uh, we have for other diseases that replicate everything that we see in Turner syndrome. So we really don't have a, a backup in this case. So this is a, an example of some life situations where we might want to think about autopsy as a way to plan the next steps. Obviously, there are, uh, there are tremendous uh, consequences for stillbirths or, or fetal death that uh, in, many, in many cases are the, are the way that we find Turner syndrome. And that is something that is emotionally difficult to discuss. But again, because we don't understand why so many fetuses don't make it, it would be very important for us to have um, some way to study that and understand at least the rates of specific abnormalities in, in those cases. Sudden or unexpected death, we already talked about, is an indication for autopsy in many different situations, but especially given the rates of cardiac disease and Turner syndrome, it would be important. And so I always push for that. If we ever hear about a, a, a case of sudden death, I always try to reach out to the relatives in our institutions and try to, try to uh, discuss that. The problem is that if you haven't had a previous discussion with the, your family and then something happens, it can be very difficult for someone who doesn't know the family to reach out and try to convince the, your relatives that an autopsy is important. So having that discussion or at least getting people to know what your wishes are is probably the most important thing. I, I just yeah. Sure. Yes, it can be very hard for us uh, as providers to have those discussions when we don't have any connection to the family. As you might understand, it's extremely difficult for us to, to uh, have those talk discussions at that time. Uh, one thing that we see a lot of is preoperative discussions. So if you are facing any sort of surgery, this is a normal branch point in your life to think about things like this, not, because the, not necessarily because of the mortality related to surgery, although that is always a consideration, but if, if there will be tissue that's harvested from your body or discarded, that is an invaluable resource. And so you need to realize that a lot of research can be done with that. And the surgeon's default position is to discard that tissue. So if you know that you're going to have an elective procedure of any kind, if it's heart surgery, if it's a skin biopsy, if it's another sort of uh, procedure, please uh, make arrangements to donate that tissue. It is easier than you might think, as we'll discuss. So yes. Can we have your around? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, in the case of an elective procedure, uh, we have, obviously, we have a research registry and we have a scientific advisory board. What we recommend is you contact, uh, you contact TSSUS. They will get you in touch with one of us, and we can actually reach out to the surgeon or doctor who's performing the procedure and make arrangements. I've done that on several occasions, and we have, uh, many of us have protocols because we're actively doing research in Turner syndrome. TSSUS will find the ones who are doing research in that area and make sure that we are involved. Yes? I, I'm sorry. Um, how quick can that happen? I'm having a cochlear implant next week, so there'll be tissue coming from all over. 
So we can we do two steps. So first of all, we reach out to the providers, who, uh, the, the surgeon, and we can actually get them to preserve the tissue. And then the second step is to uh, facilitate the research exchange of tissues. But if we know that step one, we can make sure that the tissue at least gets preserved. And that's the key step, because if the tissue is not preserved, it's no good for research. We can't go back and, and rescue it. So if we know ahead of time, we can make sure that that tissue stays intact. And, can, and then it's only a matter of time from that point we can take the steps that we need to get it to the researchers. Absolutely. That's not too quick. This, uh, surgeons know how to preserve tissues. They just need to be told this is important. A lot of times they have no idea that the Turner syndrome is such a unique uh, opportunity for research. And so they will do what they do 99% of the time, which is discard the unused tissue. Right. That's one of the reasons we're trying to raise awareness, that you, you have an invaluable resource. Your, your cells are incredibly important, and we can't do the research without you. What about Absolutely. We are actually trying to get skin biopsies now because what we're finding is a lot of Turner women are mosaic in their skin, but not in other tissues. And we think that some of the, some of the cancer susceptibility might be related to that, but without tissue, we can't prove that hypothesis. So I will definitely talk to my Absolutely. Yes, and sometimes we only need a small, very small tissue sample. So a biopsy, we can definitely use that. Sure. So, of course, there are opportunities like this when we can discuss autopsy in a more general setting, but it's always fine to talk about it with your provider or if you, if you uh, know that you're going into one of these situations, again, we can be a resource for you. We're happy to facilitate things. I can, um, in the course of our research, we contacted many organizations that promote autopsy and so we have these connections now that we can help uh, bridge the gap that, so that a lot of you can can uh, can get the resources you need to do this uh, uh, many some people have already talked about wills you know you can act in addition to discussing it with your families which is still the most important step you can formalize it and so if you're meeting with a lawyer to do a will this is something you should absolutely discuss with that lawyer while you're drafting the will there are ways to put this in and actually mechanisms to make this um, more, more under, understood for anyone who's involved. And we already talked about the importance of for this for research. So we're doing two things with cells and tissues from Turner syndrome uh, right now. One of them is in addition, we're making a tissue bank so that uh, researchers who want to study, say, thyroid disease or skin disease and Turner syndrome can then access that tissue by request, and they have to have a, a, a proposal in writing to do this. But if they have a valid research proposal, these tissues would be available. And our group also makes stem cells from, t from tissues and cells from Turner syndrome women. The stem cells are important because ultimately we're hoping we can create therapies for different sorts of organ dysfunction in Turner syndrome by taking the cells, studying them, finding out what's wrong, fixing that in, in the dish, and then building them back into new tissues and organs that could be used specifically to treat Turner syndrome. And because it would be tissue from your own body, the idea is we could take cells out, we could fix the problem, put them back, and prevent things like thyroid dysfunction and other kinds of autoimmune disease. That's the long-term goal, but it starts with getting cells to study. Yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. 
Right. So, so our group is doing research in that area. What we, have, we, we are doing is trying to make aortic valves from uh, cells from Turner syndrome patients. And so what we can do is, uh, what we're doing now is we're taking mosaic patients. Uh, we take blood from those patients and we separate the uh, chromosomally normal cells from the, the Turner syndrome cells. And then we can make heart tissue out of those cells and compare how the heart tissue functions. And the idea would be then you could build a heart valve out of the normal cells and put it back. So that's the ultimate goal. And currently there are groups that are making heart cells, uh, heart valves. Uh, the trick is to, to get the, the new cells to form the heart tissue properly. So that hasn't happened yet, but I think in 10 to 15 years that will be a reality. Yes. So now you take rejection Exactly, because you'll be... You, well, right, right now we, we print a matrix on a 3D printer, so like a uh, scaffold, and then we see the cells onto it. Eventually we'll be printing cells, but we haven't been able to do that yet. That's a goal. Yes, so a long term, the, the key will be to make sure that the, that the reproduction of the tissue layers is is uh, complete and that th it is durable. So there's a lot of testing that has to go on, but ultimately that's the goal is that everyone will have their own tissue replaced in their body instead of a mechanical or a prosthetic replacement. And I think it can happen sooner in other organs like thyroid, for instance, where we need to replace thyroid tissue because that is less dependent on a scaffold. So the goal would be to uh, or kidney tissue, or things like that. Pardon? Right. So the the longer term goal is to actually repair the Turner syndrome gene uh, gene defect in the in the cells. And there are ways. There are groups that are working on that. But what we're looking at is to actually find the genes that caught that are responsible for the abnormal cell function in each tissue. And we can find the genes on the X chromosome that, are, that need to be increased, and we can actually increase those in the cells. So that's the goal, is to look at, and also that helps us understand what specific parts of the X chromosome are required for different tissues. Um, so if you have a Y chromosome, there's increased risk for germ cell tumors like gonadoblastoma and other kinds of, of problems that you don't see without a Y chromosome. So what we, would, what we would be interested in those cases is how the Y chromosome is functioning in ovarian tissue and other kinds of germ tissue and to, to cause cancer to develop. And then we would also be interested in finding a way to block those pathways. So it would be like the opposite. Instead of promoting function, we would be trying to block function. You didn't think we'd be so interested in the research. <laughs> <laughs> never, you can never tell. Have you thought of kind of like our ongoing Healthy Heart Project has a lot of the Sure. Um, part of the problems, uh, part of the problem is that we have to do a very special treatment in order to preserve the cells within two hours. So we can't just draw the tubes and take them back to Houston. We would have to have a whole lab here, and that could be quite different. Um, yes. So the one thing that we can't do is put things in formaldehyde, like they, and that's what the surgeon's default pattern is. So we have to tell them we have to give them a preservative solution or we have to tell them to quick freeze the tissue, which is different than what they usually do. But there are pro we have a protocol for preserving the tissue that we send to the OR team and usually they are familiar with it. In some cases where they don't do a lot of, they don't see a lot of research, we have to take them through it step by step. Most of the time when I tell, I just tell them and they're like, oh yes, we've done that for another situation before. So 
So in some cases, uh, that would be true. But if we're just looking at preserving the tissue, there are things that they could do right away, and they wouldn't necessarily need any special equipment or anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many of you have had any kind of operation that, that could have? Uh, <laughs> right. We, we, this thing is oh, yeah. Sure, sure. And I think we should we should spread the message to the community that um, contact us if you're if you're contemplating or planning or scheduling surgery, and we'd be happy to reach out uh, and advocate. Right. Yes, yes. We, and that's, that's also the special nature of Turner syndrome is that so many of you see so many different specialists and have so many procedures that it actually lends, lends itself very well to this more than other conditions would. Absolutely not. Right. So anything is fair game. Anything is fair game. Because as we said, we're starting from zero, so anything that we get is tremendously valuable. Uh the does the clinic automatically preserve it? Oh, at our clinic. So, so when we have a Turner syndrome patient, we generally know in advance, uh, and so we will take steps to make sure that that happens. But not, nothing, um, nothing replaces your ability to make this happen because if you, if you insist on it, it will happen. You know, if we have to reach out to the surgeons, it, it is less likely to happen. Uh, so I think that the best way we can make this work is if people in the community start advocating for it, spread the word, if you're getting any sort of procedure, contact this. We can put it up on the website. We can make a better resource. I think that would be very important so that you know exactly what you need to do. Yes? I think we'll be just working with the specifically say to our doctor who's going to do a biopsy. This is the tissue you need to contact, and they will explain why. Absolutely. So I think what we can do is put it up on the website with a helpful link and have all the information so that people can look it up, they know who to contact, and it gives you a little information about why it's important to motivate people. So, kind of going back, could you kind of give a very short answer on, there was a um, slide about um, mortality. Mm -hmm. Would that look significantly different for the general public? Yes. Um, so let me go back here. So part of, the, part of the issue is that beginning in adulthood, there is consistently increased mortality across the lifespan. The only difference here is that the causes tend to shift more to cardiovascular above 45 years. But there are lots of, there are lots of unknowns here. These are broad categories. We don't understand the actual causes of death. People speculate but most of these are not based on autopsies because we hear about deaths in communities and we have, we have anecdotal evidence, but there's no hard scientific data. And that's what we're getting at here. There's a lot of potential causes is what this shows, but we just don't understand it. It's not automatically done. And as we'll ta discuss, there are lots of barriers to it depending on where you live. There's no... It's a patchwork of, of regulations. There's no single law about who gets an autopsy in, in this country. Yes. Um, I was going to ask, uh, if you don't have applied custody order, for example, or, and the other known things that could happen, what would be the chance of a premature death be? So we think that there is an increased risk of coronary heart disease in older women with Turner syndrome. 
we don't know precisely what the risk is, but there are reports of sudden death related to coronary disease, both heart attacks uh, due to blockages, and in some cases, dissections of the coronary arteries. Um, but this is not really well studied. So again, I, I'm just speculating here. We think that it's increased. It's, it's different, and one hypothesis is that it's just accelerated so that most people would have that increased risk in their 70s and 80s, and in Turner syndrome, it might start earlier, beginning in the 50s and 60s, but we don't know. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, we don't know. The answer is we, we know of some cases in which stents were put into the coronary arteries and there was sudden death related to the stents. We know, um, we speculate that there is, there are abnormalities in the coronary arteries, but we don't have tissue to show that. So again, at the time of surgery, if we can get some coronary tissue, that would be very helpful to understand how is it different? Is there an increased risk for disease in those arteries? And if so, what kind of disease? Because right now, what we have are case reports of blockages that were treated and then something bad happened, but we don't know what that was. And the latest one happened at our institution. I didn't know the patient and I couldn't get the autopsy because it happened at an outside hospital. So that was disappointing because anytime we hear about it, we do try to reach out to the, to the families, but it can be very hard if, if, if there's no relationship. Yes, um, and I'll talk to you about that. Yes, I'm going to talk about that autopsy doesn't mean what you might think it means, and so it's really important to emphasize that. Yes? So it sounds like there hasn't really been that much stratification of this data of like different what we call hormone No, um, and, and that's a good point. We don't know how hormone replacement therapy inter- affects this, if going off of it increases your risk, if staying on it increases your risk. There are lots of ways this could change treatment of living women if we had more information on what happens to cause sudden death. Not that I'm aware of, but I had, I had someone tell me that they had a patient in her late 80s um, as their oldest. I think it was Dr. Lin who told me that she's seen a patient that old. Um, but most of us have not seen Turner Syndrome women in their 80s. And so I know that's the case. But, and I hope that that starts to change, but that's just the facts. And what, just an informal poll of us at the, at the, in the working group, we tried, to, we tried to think for ourselves like who our oldest patients are. <laughs> Right. And I That's the hope. That's the reason we're doing all this is because we, we all were alarmed that we're not seeing older women. And so here is... Yes. Yes. And so this is, this is one of the misconceptions about autopsy that a lot of times people think it means that we'll, you will be carved up, all of your organs will be removed, and there will be no body left, essentially. Um, what we propose for Turner syndrome is a minimally invasive autopsy. It can give us the same information, but at the end you have a body that is returned to the family and can even be used for an open casket funeral. So the idea is that it avoids the dissection that you typically 
hear about in autopsies. And instead of taking out whole organs, you take small samples of many organs. And for us in research, that's just as valuable because, as we said, we don't need large numbers of cells or tissues to make a diagnosis of disease or to actually use them for research. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yes, because it's highly targeted. So you can actually specify what samples you want from which organs. And that's something I would, you know, if you do have a specific um, concern about that, that's something that we can definitely work with you to come up with a, a plan, an individual plan. But the idea is because even within the organs, you're only taking core samples, not the whole organ, uh, there really is minimal external visible damage. This is something that can be very targeted and specified for specific organs. Yes? Right. So generally, this has to be done within 24 to 72 hours of death. And so the, the sampling process must be on as soon as possible. And, right, and it takes only a couple hours. After that, the body can be returned to the family for the funeral. So this, uh, this is something that is, can be used within the time span of a normal uh, burial preparation. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> no, these are important questions. So uh, in addition to the uh, biopsies of many different organs, it usually uses CT or MRI scans or ultrasound scans in order to recreate uh, images of the entire body, usually in 3D. And that allows us to do what's called a virtual autopsy. You can slice those images. You can look for say, cancer or other kinds of abnormalities that might have led to sudden death without doing the dissection. So it is a combination of both sampling and imaging. So these are some samples uh, of tissues that we think are relevant to understanding causes of death in Turner syndrome. As you can see, it spans the entire body. And it doesn't mean that we would necessarily need to get these from every single woman with Turner syndrome, but they can tell us a lot whether they're normal or abnormal about the frequency of disease, about the kinds of things that we should be looking for and screening for. So this would be very helpful. And again, we're talking about very small samples of these different tissues. So there are many challenges, as you all know. Um, one of them is that autopsies are not routinely performed, depending on where you live. Even for people who die suddenly, in some places there are not routine autopsies. There's a lot of lack of knowledge. Um, as an example, there was a recent frontline investigation about this, and it showed that the majority of counties in America don't have medical examiners. They have coroners. There's a huge difference between those. A coroner is not a licensed professional. Anyone can be a coroner. You don't need any medical knowledge or experience to be a coroner. So if your county has a coroner, it's as good as not having anyone. They pronounce death and they, they are not, they have no medical or professional degrees. Uh, it's actually an elected position. You can run to be a coroner. Yeah. <laughs> You, I mean, they, there can be doctors who are coroners, but the point is you don't have to. You don't have to have a medical degree. Right. Right. So um, in more than half the counties in, the America, in America, that is the situation. And so you're not going to be able to explain Turner syndrome to someone like that and why it's important to do an autopsy. So that's why reaching our national network is important. So what I will describe to you is, is a network that allows you to contact a medical examiner or professional and bring them to your, the county where you live and do and have an autopsy. They can, they can make that happen for you, and it's free. So that's why it's important to know about this system. 
Obviously, the, otherwise, if you tried to do it yourself, it is incredibly expensive. There's a lot of legal, procedural, and financial barriers. So for people who don't know anything about autopsy, it is extremely intimidating. And there are some legal restrictions. Um, so if you don't know um, uh, the legal landscape, you, it can be very uh, difficult. And also, you need to do it in a timely fashion. So a lot of these barriers prevent you from collecting fresh tissue. And, and again, that is important for research. So the most important thing is to prepare and to understand how to make this happen. So how do you start? So after we had our discussion last year, we reached out to two organizations that have pledged to work with you and the Turner Syndrome community to make autopsy and tissue donation happen. These are the Brain Donor Project and the NIH Neurobiobank. So even though it says brain banks, these are brain and tissue banks that are funded by the government to collect tissue for researchers across the country. So they're the only federated network of these banks. There are six sites where these tissues are stored throughout the country, and they will distribute the tissue to researchers based on the merits of their proposal. You submit a written proposal, I want to study Turner syndrome, I want to study thyroid disease, they would give you tissue. It accepts and encourages do donation of tissue from control individuals. That means family members without Turner syndrome are welcome to donate. They will be treated exactly the same um, because we need to understand how tissues differ in health and disease. Yeah, like your siblings or right, like your siblings. So they can participate too, and sometimes that actually might be a helpful thing, discussion to have when you're explaining why this is important. Uh, they have really strict guidelines, and that's important. You want to make sure that you're donating your tissues and organs to someone who's going to benefit, uh, it's going to benefit the community, and it's going to be done ethically, responsibly, correctly. So these are all, everything is available online. They have methods and publication requirements for this kind of uh, research that uh, mandate that they acknowledge the source. And so you can see exactly what they're doing with the tissues. And it also supports a lot of academic research. Uh, I think they said there are $70 million in grants that have been obtained from these types of tissue donations and research projects. So how do you, how do you personally sign up for this? This is the uh, landing page, braindonorproject.org. Um, Brain, the Brain Donor Project was founded in 2015. It is an advocacy group, and its goal is to raise awareness of organ and tissue donation to that NIH neurobiobank. So the biobank is actually where the tissues would get stored. This, uh, this group built a website that allows you to sign up easily online. I will try to make them available after the conference, but I don't have coffee, copies right now. So if you need me to go back and want to take a picture, I can do that. Okay. <laughs> so this is, the, this is the website. You click on the sign up button in the upper right corner. And then you say, become a brain donor. Now that, again, it's brain and tissue. It's all about brain donation because the origin of this was Alzheimer's disease research. But they collect other tissues. And I'll show you how that works. So there is a, there's a sign-up form that basically says, why are you doing this? What sort of conditions do you have? It's really important that when you answer this question, has the donor been diagnosed with a neurologic condition or disease, you put... Turner syndrome as the, as the nature of condition or disease. What this will do is the, the groups have, have agreed that this will prioritize your sample uh, to do a minimally invasive tissue collection, just like the kind we talked about, and to have your tissue stored at the University of Maryland Biobank because uh, the director there, Tom Blanchard, has a specific interest in Turner syndrome and has agreed to take all the samples from the community uh, as we specified, different tissues throughout the, uh, throughout the body and store them in a systematic fashion there. And that would be available to the whole neurobiobank network, just as I described. Okay, so you wouldn't need any other, say, a lawyer or something? 
For this, you do. So, so for this, they go by your by by your wishes. Yes, and you will get some paperwork that you need to sign and fill out. This isn't the extent of it, but this is uh, this is an individual. Yes, you can personally sign up, and this um, the the issue. The issue with notifying your relatives comes in at the time of death because someone needs to contact the brain donor project that you have died and that they should initiate the collection protocol. So you still need to have al- allies or advocates at the, at the time of death. Right. So th- then you check the box that indicates you to agree to their terms and conditions and click the blue box mark submit. At that point, is that all there is to the form? that's all there is to the online form. Now they will send they will send you in the mail after you sign up a a, a formal document where, that you have to sign and and mail back to them, and that kind of finalizes the the deal. It also gives you a brochure with lots of information and contacts. So there is phone there is a phone number uh, that that you can call 24 hours a day to access the, the biobank staff and let them know that a death has occurred. And there's also a website on there. So there's a lot of information they'll send to you about how it works and what you need to, what you need to tell your, your friends and loved ones. What is the website for this? It's back up to braindonorproject.org. And again, I will try to make uh, work with Cindy to put this on the TSSUS uh, resources page so that anyone who's interested in organ and tissue donor donation can access this online. Yes? Sure. Mm-hmm. Right, I already sent the presentation to Cindy, and so I'm hopeful that she can make it available as well. All right. Uh, and so, how does it work on death? Um, again, one of your one of your designated uh, advocates or, or family members must notify the brain bank, um, th- and once that happens, they will coordinate the trans- uh, transportation to a local facility where the tissues are removed. Now, it doesn't, for Turner syndrome, it won't be the brain um, because that is specifically for neurologic disease. So we have a different protocol that we agreed on with them that includes the minimally invasive autopsy. So that includes thyroid tissue, heart tissue, lung tissue, liver tissue, kidney tissue, for instance. There are approximately 10 items on the list. And what we will do is make sure what, at the time that they, they mail you the consent that you understand which tissues would be harvested. And if you have an objection to one, they will work with you to customize it at that point. They're open to talking with you. They actually told me, tell them to call, call him. Uh, Tom Blanchard, email uh, information will be on that inf- form, and they will, they will work with you to collect whatever tissues you think are important. Yes. I have a, a question. So you had mentioned research. Um, mm-hmm. Is there any um, value uh, there must be in knowing the, the first step that you do if someone is mosaic or even if they're not karyotype that tissue? Yes, that's what we do. We, when we get tissue samples, we karyotype them as a matter of course because a lot of times we do discover things that weren't reported in life. Um, it's more common than you might think. And so that's really important for us to be able to categorize the tissues because obviously we do different studies if they're mosaic versus if they're 45X. Well, well, yeah. they're just looking at the yeah. details and they're doing it. Right, and that's, that's the other advantage is that we can look at uh, different tissues and cells than they would do for a karyotype while you're alive. Uh-huh. 
There's always some residual thyroid tissue, even if it's removed. It's usually microscopic, but um, they may or may not be able to get it. It would be, uh, I mean, they, they would use ultrasound to try to locate it, and then they usually pass the needle there. So if it's small, they might not be able to get it. It's true. Yes, so what they will do is find a local uh, medical examiner or pathologist who has agreed to work with them. They have these throughout the country. So there's usually one within three to four counties of where you live, depending on where you live. Now, if it's an urban center, there's probably one in the county. Uh, But these are all affiliated with the NIH, and they will come and do the harvesting right away. Within, usually, as soon as you call them, they, they go into, into, into action. And, and then after that, they will give you a report, and everything that they take is, all, is, is, catalog, is cataloged. So you, know, you can tell right away what has been done. Um, so then after that, the body is released to the family for funeral or cremation, whatever, you, whatever your wishes are. So this is really important. They cover all the costs of this. You pay nothing. Okay? So that's really important. It's the only way you can get this done for free. No additional financial burden is placed on one's family. And um, a traditional funeral service may still be planned after the recovery because it does not interfere with open casket viewing. Okay? And then anyone, regardless of age, can donate. Anyone can sign up. There's no age restriction. You can sign up now, whether you intend to do it or not, and you can revoke it at any time. So it's not binding. If your family, say, wanted this report, could they, like, when you get a death report from mm-hmm. an autopsy to a family member, could they get that? Yes. Or is that not well, they, can, they will give you a report about um, what, what they harvested and, and what amounts of tissue are available because that also gets public. It's a public record. It goes into the biobank for anyone to request it. So anyone can see like what tissues are, are present. It won't have the name on it, obviously, but it will have like things like age, condition, things like that. Okay, so the big thing to do is first think about it because if you don't think about it, life passes by and register Tell your family and friends and loved ones about it. And that these are the two websites that uh, I refer to. So one is the Brain Donor Project where you sign up. The BT Bank is the website for the University of Maryland Brain and Tissue Bank. And that's where the Turner Syndrome samples will be stored. So you can get a lot of information about what they do. It's basically uh, the NeuroBioBank website. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, I think I'm done. That's my presentation, so. (laughs) Sure. Okay. Yes, so this doesn't preclude removing organs as well. So if, you, uh, if, if they can still remove the brain, because that is really what the, what the biobank was founded to do. Um, and, and again, they do it in such a way that it wouldn't change anything else that I just said. Sure. Um, what, I, what I think we should do is come up with a form where you can specify which tissues you agree to donate. Uh, so there's a long list, and some people uh, may not want all of those tissues t- taken. And some people might have tissues that are not on the list. So it's, it's completely understandable. And I think everything is so valuable that we cannot turn anything down at this point. Everything has such intrinsic value for research. Yes. For me personally, I don't care about a minimally invasive autopsy. Who do you want? Can I make that wish known so you guys can dig a little deeper? You'll like it. I mean, sure. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> it, this doesn't, this doesn't um, 
uh, preclude doing a regular autopsy with a dissection. You can do all of those things. Uh, what we do recommend for this, though, is the minimally invasive approach because it gets us core tissue samples that are rapid and can be preserved. And so that's a little different than they would do in a regular autopsy. But you can do both, for sure. Yes, there are six sites. There's one at the University of Miami, University of Maryland. Um, I can't remember the others off the top of my head, but there are six sites. If you go to that btbank.org, it shows you all six sites and what they do. They all are under the same funding, and so they have basically the same structure and requirements. And, uh, well, and what happens is, depending on where you live, um, that that local, the regional center is the one that's going to coordinate the minimally invasive autopsy and finding, finding the logistics for that. So it'll be close, the one closest to where you live. Yes? Is there like a form that you can, like the living will type of form where you can have it put in your chart? Yes, absolutely. Um, so there is, there is some, if you go to these two websites, there are uh, ways to notify your provider in there, and there's a, there are forms that you can that you can use as part of a, a will or as part of your medical record. Absolutely. Right. Yes, so there is nothing about this that prevents you from donating organs to in another format or doing a full autopsy. This is all compatible with other forms of organ and tissue donation uh, because we're just taking a small sample and the rest of it will be left behind. So you can use that other, those other tissues and organs however you want. Sure. Thank you.